Hi there, my name is Marcel van der Kwast, and thank you for listening to this episode of my podcast. It's called Here is AMC. In it, I talk to interesting people in the field of employer branding, recruitment marketing, and everything related to that topic. Normally, this podcast is in Dutch, but I hope you can hear that I'm trying to speak English right now. That's because in episode 30, I have as a guest Mr. James Ellis. In his own words, he is the world's most caffeinated employer brand nerd. We're going to discuss a lot of interesting things about employer branding. If you want to know more about this podcast, it's all on the website hereisarmc.nl. Mind you, that's Dutch spelling. Or check my LinkedIn page. Again, thank you for listening and enjoy the episode. Hi, James. Good morning to you in Chicago. Uh, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for being I'm glad to be here. I've uh, been looking forward to this for quite some time. Okay, well, thank you. I hope I can live up to those uh, expectations. Nah. Um, before we start our conversation, let me first tell my listeners why I think it's more than interesting to have you as my guest. Um, James Ellis is, in his own words, an employer brand nerd. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Started three and a half years ago with his podcast, The Talent Cast, a weekly show on employer branding. And still going strong, the counter is at over 170 episodes. That's uh, massive. But you do a lot more publications, a weekly newsletter, one book recently published, two more on the way. You have become one of the most interesting voices in employer branding, in my humble opinion. The reason for that is that I think you make the subject very clear on a strategic level, but also translate it to the practical day-to-day -day job as an employer brander. That's, well, what I like the most of it. And I'm also extra triggered by your focus on content marketing for employer branding. That's also my expertise, so I'm pleased honored in a way to have you in my podcast because I think you should be heard by as many people possible in Holland in the talent acquisition field. So for that reason, welcome again, James. And uh, <laughs> so far, the <laughs> well, it's been nice talking to so everybody. Got to go. Uh, <laughs> I'm never going to live up to that. And the fact that you said that I make things simple, that 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 boggles the mind a little bit. But we'll, we'll see what we can do today. We'll make, I well, make no promises, me. but we'll make trust me, uh, I think I think you do. But uh, uh, that this was not a proper introduction of who you are, James. Uh, and it feels really strange because I've been listening to your podcast for more than over three years. That gives me the feeling that, well, I know you. I, I already know you. But it's the first time, well, yesterday we had a little uh, uh, preparation talk, but that was the first time we actually met. So that feels very strange. But yeah. please use this uh, uh, opportunity to, to introduce yourself in a proper way, James. I, I don't have a proper way. I have about a dozen goofy ways to do it because I can't take myself too seriously. I try not to because it's a bad idea. Um, I, I, I'm just... Too, I am an employer brand nerd. I really am. It's really all I care about. It's what I think about. It's what I write about. It's what I talk about. It's what I do. I landed in it backwards. I was in marketing forever. I was in content marketing. I was in event marketing. I had done every kind of marketing under the sun. And I got recruited by a big, massive agency in the recruiting space. We won't worry about that. Um, and it became very clear to me that Recruitment marketing is special, and it's special in this way. And this is this. I keep coming back to this because it is. It's 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 the the touchstone for why I do what I do. Every other kind of marketing is about more. It's about more leads. It's about more eyeballs. It's about more share of wallet. It's about more conversions. About more, 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 more. Everything's about more. Now, it's not bad. That's that's actually quite good. It's what they're there for. But at no point does anyone say, "I'd love to sell you a donut. I'd like to see a resume." I only have the one donut. I'm going to sell it to the best person. Can you explain this gap in your resume about the three months in which you did not eat a donut? Can you give me references for people who've seen you eat a donut? It doesn't work that way. Recruitment marketing is about quality because we only have one of things. Now, in any other sector, if we only had one of things, we'd have an auction, right? We'd say to the highest bidder or the lowest bidder, this is what this talent is worth. But we don't have that. This is a deeply weird, deeply strange, deeply unique set of circumstances and way of looking at the world that I think has not been properly explored. And I get up every day thinking, how do I push it? How do I try harder? How do I explore more for myself, but really for the entire industry? How do I make employer brand as fascinating to everybody else as it is to me? That's what I do. And so that's why I get to write and talk and write and do all the stuff. That's why I do what I do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's finally the proper introduction. Um, so Such we're going to talk. A, we're talk, uh, talking a lot about employer branding. Let's start with the well, the very beginning. Um, what's your definition of employer branding? 
So the classic example, and I think it's a valid one, um, is employer branding is when a single person thinks it's like to work in your company based on touch points, experiences, information, content, what have you, and then that seen in the aggregate. So if there's a thousand people, what do a thousand people individually think it's like to work at your company based on what they've seen, done, touched, experienced? So if you're a company that no one's ever heard of, if you're a startup, you have no employer brand, okay, that you have to build something out of nothing. If you're a company, uh, in the States, we have cable companies. We want, you, know, you have to call the cable company and they're horrible. The customer service is notoriously unpleasant and hard and, and, and they have a hard time hiring people because everybody they want to hire at one point had to call that number and ask for their, their service to be turned on or turned off and it was yep. not a pleasant experience. So those experiences, even though they're not recruiting experiences, impact what I perceive it's like to work at that company. So which that means employer branding is... It, it, it's an impossible job because it does – it is in fact impacted by what leadership does, good or bad, what the news is, good or bad, what the company does, good or bad, what customer service, good or bad, the products you choose, the services you choose, the this internal culture, all the recruiters, the all of it impacts the employer brand. What I love and hate about it at the same time because – uh, you know, there you are, um, is that if all that stuff is impacting the employer brand, the employer brand professional doesn't have any power over any of that. They have zero power, which is why only crazy people do this job. Only crazy people are willing to say, yeah, I'm going to take that all on me, even though I have no way of changing it myself. At best, we can influence. At best, we can, can persuade and convince people that there's a better way to do it. But it's a weird job. But that is what employer brand at its heart is. Yep. That said, I mean, you can get deeper. I mean, because if you think about it, that's what a textbook version of it is. A deeper version of it is simply how much does someone want to work at your company, right? That, that is, it seems so obvious and so simple. I think we skip past it. But we go straight to the more complicated textbook versions because they're unpackable and, and, and digestible, but whatever. But simply, a strong brand is one where people want to work for you and have a good reason why, right? It's not just... You know, you think of Google. Google has thousands and thousands of applications every single day. How many of those people understand what it means to work at Google? And how many of them just go, I like Gmail. I like Maps. I like the tools. I use the search. It's pretty nice. I got a cool phone. I want to work there. Probably a very small measure of it. So, you know, you can say, yes, people want to, but are they the right people? Do they want to work there for the right reasons? That is where employer brand really lives when you get right down to it. And all the stuff on top of it, the recruitment marketing, the stories, the content, the metrics, the tools, the platforms, everything is supporting this idea of how do I get someone to want to work here? That's what it is in a nutshell. And I hear two things uh, in, in your story. Um, the, the first thing is it's a lot about perception of what people make of it in their, their heads. So the real yeah. employer brand is not what you have in your organization. That's, that's yeah. what you want. But uh, uh, at the end, it is what, what's the, the, the sum in their heads. Yeah. That, that's the employer brand. Which is why and good employer branders spend half their time thinking about not just what their company is, but what do people they want to reach care about? Yep, and how do you yep. make those connections? If you just focus inwardly and contemplate your belly button, you know, in a corporate fashion, I guess, um, you're only going to get so far. It's great, but you have to understand what people are looking for, what they want, how they see you, how they perceive you, all that stuff enters into it. Yep. Yeah. And there's also a part of it that's, uh, that's emotional. It's not just rational. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 there are companies that I would never, ever in a million years work for. If you backed a truck full of money up to my house, they say, here it is, take it, it's a dream job, take it. They're companies I never want to work for. Is that rational? Of course not. Money, money is rational. Money is completely rational. But they're companies I don't believe in. In fact, they're anathema and loathsome to everything I stand for, so I'm not going to do it. Yep. It is emotional. It is personal. Your choice of job, let's be fair, your choice of job says so much about who you are as a person. So if you stand up and say, I work for Coke, I work for Pepsi, it says something about you. I work for Red Cross, I work for a, a hedge fund, I work for Facebook, I work for a startup. It says something about you. And what happens is, is that we all have those stories we tell ourselves about how we do things and why we do things and who we are. And maybe it's a very tiny voice in the back of our head. Maybe it's almost so conscious that we don't realize we choose that pair of shoes because that speaks to who we are. Yep. It tells yep. the story of who we are. The job you work at is that times a thousand. And so you have to be very clear about how do you make that connection? How do you make it 
how does that person want to work for that job? What do they get out of it? What is the story they're telling themselves? What will be the story they tell themselves once they get that job? Why is that attractive? It's incredibly deep, um, but we end up talking about what your glass door score is, which is unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not a, it's not about tools. It's about a, a, a general feeling. It's it's more yeah. a way of almost a way of life, but it, it's it's well, it's a, it's a way of thinking. It's, it, I, I think of it more philosophically instead yep. of strat- strategically. I think there's so much about how do you perceive the options. I was just talking to a massive company, and you know, I was telling the story of what I did at Groupon, which is a, a good-sized company, but compared to this massive company, night and day, night and day. I, and we had, I had peanuts to play with, and I was teaching them, hey, this is what I did when I had the peanuts, when I had very, very limited resources, what some cool ideas we had, what we came up with. And they said, that's really cool. And then when we inject a bajillion dollars into it and do it this way, I'm like, that's really cool too. But your context and my context will be different, just like my context and your context and everybody's context are different. And so yeah. taking a philosophical approach says, I can read the context, I can read the ecosystem, I can look at my set of constraints and considerations and make the best of what I have instead of how do I beat Google? Because Google's gonna be Google, you can't beat Google, you can't be Google, so you gotta be the best you there is. And that yep. is, that is, that's, that is very philosophical more than anything yep. else in my head. Yep. I like it, I like the, 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 the link with philosophical and also it's, it's, it's some state of mind, I guess. But yes. um, if you have to, to uh, summarize the direction of employer branding in the last few years what what what's in what direction do you see it moving okay so i like to do this historically and geographically if you can believe it so way back a long time ago in the this thing before this um, internet thing happened um we all just applied for the job in the sunday paper the saturday paper right we you know it was a tiny little black on white there was about a hundred words on it at best it told half the time it didn't tell you what the company was right it was just here send your you know looking for a, a mail agent looking for a postal guy looking for a, a, a writer looking for whatever and send your resume send your cv to this address that's all you got then 1991 happened and simon burroughs kind of invented employer brand and i don't do this pejoratively i do it because it was always there he just finally put his finger on it and said yeah guys it's right here and we all went Oh, you're right. Oh, yeah, of course, obviously. And Europe and the UK really kind of owned that. I really think, you know, the, 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 the primary towers of employer brand early on were London and the Netherlands, right? There, this is, this is where they grew. This is where they started. But it was very much a how do you apply consumer packaging and consumer uh, branding models to a recruiting function? And it was, it was interesting because you got great lift immediately and then it plateaued pretty quickly as you all learned the rules, right? If you go to work for Procter & Gamble, if you go to work for Mrs. G, Mrs. Gordon's Fish Fillets, right? There's a brand management process and you apply the process. And that's really what you did there. In the States, we said, ah, uh-uh, we're just gonna make a bunch of ads. We're just gonna yell at you until you apply. And that worked great for a while until it didn't. And so we all went this way. In the last four or five years, the streams have crossed. I think right now, some of the most interesting recruitment marketing technology is happening on your side of the world, and some of the most interesting employer brand thinking is happening on my side of the world. Now, I don't separate them out as being good or being bad. I simply, I do think they need each other, but it's interesting where you guys had such a huge advantage and we took all these notes. Oh, wow, they did this. Oh, wow, that's a great idea. Oh, let's do that. It's kind of flipped around where we are getting the chance to show because we're we're inventing it clean, whereas you have 30 years of history of how you're supposed to do it, kind of slowing you down in a lot of ways. So you need to kind of figure out how to sh- unshackle that yeah. and turn it on to the next one. So that to me is where it is. But I think companies, leadership, you know, they read the articles in Harvard Business. They read the articles in all the various places you're supposed to do. Everybody knows you're supposed to be involved in employer brand. They still have fuzzy ideas of what that means. Um, our data at Universum shows that, you know, even leadership, 80% of leaders get what employer brand means. That means 20 of them don't. These are big companies. These are good companies. These are good leaders. They just don't quite grasp it because they're busy doing other things. I get it. But that means when they say, we need employer brand, you have to ask yourself, what exactly do they think they're buying? What exactly do they think they're asking for? And until you unpack all that stuff, it becomes, 
kind of like what AI and machine learning was five years ago, where everybody's just kind of talking and you're like, do these things connect? Every, it's yeah. so new. It's so, we're inventing it as we go and none of it makes sense. So I think always unpacking it, starting at a definition, starting at, at, at first principles and understanding the reasons why, that has to be the first goal. And that does slow things down for a while, but I think it leads to much, much better work down the road. Yeah, yeah. What, what you see, my uh, in my experience, the last years we've, we've, well, for 10 years, we've been preaching that uh, employer branding starts inside your company. Yeah. Uh, you have to start inside to win outside. But yeah. still, the perception or the misperception is uh, we only need employer branding when we have difficulties hiring people. Yeah. And then they still see employer branding as a campaign. And yeah. the, the question now is, well, tell me what a campaign is because I can't see it anymore. And yeah. there are uh, large employers who need campaigns. But sure. you see now for the last years, you see it really uh, uh, breaking, well, well, not breaking through, but everybody understands that it really starts inside. It's coming. And it's then coming. you see good examples. Yeah. But, but there's also another misperception I want to uh, lay on your feet. Um, mm. uh, it's also a perception that employer branding is something for uh, large employers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I hear that but, a lot too. Well, I think... Uh, uh, small employers are uh, have a great advantage in employer branding, but Certainly. can you uh, uh, shine your light on that? What, what if I if maybe I should ask the question: uh, Why should I, as a small employer, mm. need employer branding? So. I can see where the perception comes that bigger companies need it, given if you just look at the economics of it, you know, you have a thousand people you have to hire, cost per hire. If you can decrease your cost per hire by 5% because of good employer branding across a thousand hires, that, that nets out. There's an ROI there. That's a very clear business, business reason why you do that thing. If you're hiring three people, the economic reason doesn't make as much sense. However, if you're in a startup, if you're in a small company, those three people have an outsized impact on what the company ends up doing. If you hire just three mediocre people in your massive company, they're gonna hide from you and you're never gonna notice them and they're gonna fall off eventually. It's not gonna be a big deal. Bad hires happen. In a startup, in a small company, bad hires kill companies, right? These are horrible, hor these are cancers that start, right? Bad cultures start from one bad hire who injects a bad culture and it just starts to fester and grow until you can't get rid of it. So having an employer yeah. brand that level, meaning, Understanding why we do what we do, how we do what we do, what we're looking for, that it's not just about we have a paycheck and we're waving it so someone can take it. That is far more important on the small company than it is in the big company. And that means understanding, getting deeper beyond, hey, we have a job, do you want a job? It's got to be about we're changing the world in this way. This is, these are the people we are. These are the kind of people we think would be successful. We want to be surrounded by these kinds of people. And if you're that kind of pe person, we want to be with you. To be crystal clear about that is very, very hard. There's a guy uh, named David C. Baker who wrote a really good book called The, Biz uh, uh, the Business of Expertise. It's an ex excellent book on positioning. It's my favorite book on positioning, actually, even though it's not really about positioning. He deals with companies in the U.S. mostly, mostly creative agencies. And a creative agency says, yeah, we're a full service creative, creative agency. We can make your billboard, we can make your website, we can make your campaign, we can make your email, we can do all that stuff. There's seven of us here, we can do it all. Except there's a thousands and thousands of those companies. How do you pick one over the other? And you learn to position yourself, say, this is what we do, this is how we do it. Now, as a business owner, that is very scary to do because when you say, if we only focus on, and I'm making stuff up here, the Latin American, female Latin American social media channels. This is where we are experts, that no one else can beat us when it comes to female Latin American social media. The business owner says, that's great, but I'm probably letting business I might've taken fall away. And the yeah. idea of letting business walk away is terrifying, right? You want every dime you can get. And that's why businesses are bad at positioning because they look at the opportunity cost of the money they let walk away and they say, I'm gonna expand my position to be that too. Now take that to an employer brand. If you say, we're here to solve this problem and we are this kind of person, there might be someone who is just slightly off that target, who would be a great hire for a while till they became really pains in the butts because they didn't align with the rest of the company. Now, as a business owner, you go, if they're a great hire, I wanna hire, I wanna bring them in. As an employer brander, you say you have to let some of those people walk away. You have to let good talent, good talented people who don't quite fit, find their happiness elsewhere.
So being able to draw a line around your position and say, this is who we are, this is what we're about, this is what we care about, this is what we value, and being willing to say that excludes everybody else and we're comfortable with that takes a lot of cojones, efforts, ovaries, whatever you want to call it, it takes a lot of guts. And that doesn't happen very often. But in a small company, you can because you do have a leader who says, you know what, I started a company with nothing. I tried this. I have the guts to do it. They get to make those decisions. So when you can get those confluence of events where the owner, leader, founder, what have you, is willing to have the guts to make those decisions, to draw lines like that very hard and fast, you create a very strong culture. That strong culture then amplifies itself because there's nothing getting in the way. And suddenly they're clear as day, an interesting company to work at. And that begets a strong brand, which of course attracts more of the better talent. Yep. So it's amazing how it can work. It's just, it, it take, just that conversation was complicated. Just that conversation was wandering around and it's a tough thing to, to kind of pitch. It's much easier to say, if you do it, you're a big brand, you save X amount of dollars, X amount of pounds, X amount of euros, whatever, easy conversation. That's why, that's why those yep. conversations happen there. Interesting, interesting, because uh, the, the the distance to leadership is a, a big chance for small companies yes. because they have uh, they have mostly one person uh, running around with a flag and a, a bunch of people following them. For me, that's employer branding because the, yeah. the, I always look for the one with the flag. And well, I it's very difficult to find him in larger corporations, but it, it's yeah, I uh, I agree with you. I agree with you most of the times, more than my own wife. But uh, let <laughs> I let them, uh, her not hear it. Um, I try to bring you to the next le- next uh, topic, but there's there's one in between question because now yeah. we have COVID nineteen or Corona yeah. happening. Yeah. Um, is that just an interruption in the development of the employer brand field, or is it a drastic change of direction? I think more than anything, this is the crucible we're going through to strip out the junk that didn't matter, the stuff that we thought mattered that doesn't matter. For example, the conversations I am having this week, this month about the concept of culture at a company are about seven times better than the conversations I had three months ago about culture at a company. Because culture at a company, you know, a couple weeks, a couple months ago was, we've got beer pong, we've got kombucha taps, we've got cold brew, we work on home for Fridays. It perk, 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 perk. Not culture, because no one really knew what culture was. Because culture is what happens when all the other stuff gets stripped away. Well, here comes COVID and Corona that stripped it all away and said, okay, you're not in the same room anymore. You don't have the kombucha tap at your house, unless you do, in which case, enjoy. Um, You're not getting the free snacks delivered to your house. Um, You're having to do this in an awkward spot in your dining room or your living room or your bedroom or what have you. Um, The chips are down. Things are harder, so how do you respond? And that is how you look at a, at a culture. It's about when things are bad and when things are hard, how do you respond, right? The idea that you know, a crisis is reveal who we really are, same thing here. Now we're really, yep. this is what your culture really is. I always you know, look at companies who are super successful who talk about how they have a great culture. I said, how when you know what your culture even is? You haven't had a bad day in 10 years, right? Your stock price has done nothing but rise like bread. I mean, it's insane. Any problem is mitigated by the fact that you're all getting filthy rich and you all know that. So consequently, problems go away. Who cares if you know I, you know I, I felt snubbed? Who cares about the politics when we're all getting filthy rich? It's when things get bad that we go. This is what's going on, yep. and I think that's just an example of how this is really forcing us to relook and reexamine what it means to have an employer brand. What do we do with employer brand? Where does it come from? How do we influence it to shape it, to distill it, to project it out to the world? Yep. Yep. Um, you know, I think one of the rarely talked about elements of an employer brand are corporate policies. So. Think about companies who talk a great game about gender equality. We care about women and women's issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, it's Women's History Month. Let's put a big thing on the website. We care about women. And in the States, they have a thing called the Family Marriage and Leave Act, right? It's, it's family. It, it, it's, you know, you have a baby, you get to go home. And in, in your part of the world, you don't have to worry about that because the rules are great. In the States, we get six weeks unpaid family leave. That is the bare minimum. And so if a company says, we care about women, we care about women's issues, and we care about Women's History Day, and you see that their policy says bare legal minimum, let me tell you what they really care about. It's not women. No. So the policies are one of those quiet influencers of how people can perceive an employer brand. Now, 
with COVID and everybody has to work from home, it's kind of like been this etch-a-sketch where everybody shakes it up and says, like, hey, clean sheet of paper, everybody, let's start again. Let's start, start cold. Okay, yeah, we can work from home. Yeah, we can work remote. Yes, we can do all Zoom. Yes, we can. Okay, well, if that's true, what else can we do? What else can we do? If, if companies aren't paying out the wazoo for rent that they may or may not have needed, maybe they do invest in their people. Maybe they do invest in family leave. Maybe they do invest in different kind of cultural. I think there's a huge shift about to happen. I have no prediction of where it's going because it is a clean sheet of paper, but I think the opportunity is finally here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, clear. And also the, the uh, being together as a, as a team Oh, yeah. used to be, uh, uh, well, uh, automatically, but now you have to organize that. And there's also, uh, well, th that's an, 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 a challenge for, for, for employers. Yeah. Okay, okay. Next to the, uh, uh, over to the next topic. Uh, if you look at an employer brand, um, there's, what do you consider the core of an employer brand? And, and, and how do you, in your practice, who, who, how do you discover it? There's a million ways and no ways to answer that question right. So I'm going to give you with this. Ultimately, your employer brand is, 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 is the proof to the world that you care. And that's a simple, that's, that's, like a, that's, a, that's a greeting card. That's a fortune cookie, right? Blah, 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 blah. What it means is every company cares about something. Hedge funds care about cash, care about growth and cash. Red Cross cares about saving lives. Pharmaceutical companies care about inventing new drugs. Uh, The automotive companies think about safety and they think about growing their audience for what for their for transportation. Companies care about things. Do they reward those things they care about? Okay, you're strengthening your employer brand, right? If you if you're at the Red Cross and your job is to and you, what you care about is saving lives, but I save too many lives and I, I I don't get a bonus, then you don't care about saving lives. You care about something else. If you're at a hedge fund and you make a lot of money and you don't get a bonus, you don't care about making money. You care about something else. So if you can take what you care about and line it up with what you reward, and then you project that out to the world to say, this is what we care about and this is what we reward. And someone goes, I want to be rewarded for that because that's what I care about too. And you make that connection, that's a strong employer brand. That is what the core of it is. What you reward is who you are, right? You can say all the nice pretty words about all the stuff you care about. Facebook's great at this, right? They do a great job telling everybody about all the stuff they care about, making connections. And then you read the news and you realize maybe they don't care about that stuff quite as much as they care about selling ads. That's what the company cares about. That's why Facebook's employer brand is very complex, right? They are providing connection, but at the same time, what they reward is selling more ads. And how do you build that narrative? How do you build that story? Who is going to be involved in that? Who is going to care about that just as much as you? So to me, if you can figure out how to fi figure out what you reward, tell that story in a way that people go, oh, I get that. that that's believable. That's authentic. I understand that I can project myself into that story. And I want that too. That's where your employer brand starts. So you've got to figure out all the stuff that happens. How do you strip it down to the bare core of what do you reward? And sometimes to make that more complicated, the reward is not financial. It's not just saying, what does our bonus structure say? Sometimes it's, who are the people who get promoted? Are they the people who are the renegades and the rebels who are willing to step out on the ledge and do the thing no one's ever done? Do they get promoted? Do they get lauded? That's what you reward. That's what you care about. Do you care about playing safe and staying inside the bounds of the box and never ever getting, you know, tilting the, the, the boat at all? That's what you reward, and that's what you care about. And if it, it's hard to get at some of those things. You really have to dig below the obvious to say, what do you really care about? What happens when things go bad? So when I talk to, to companies, I ask questions like, tell me about the last time things went wrong. How did you respond? How did the team respond? How did you, you, know, how did you get through it? Do you still feel like you resolve those problems? Or are they lingering? Are there grudges? You know, what is going on? What happens now that you're at home? How do you resolve conflicts? How do you, you know, how do you praise each other? Each other? What do you praise each other for? Those are the things that get to the root of what this, the people, it's a very human thing, what the people at this company care about and how they respond. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Clear. And, and there, then you got the, the story, the EVP or whatever mm -hmm. you, you call it. Yep. Um, in, well, when we record this, it is, it is the, the, the most recent episode of your, uh, uh, your podcast. Um, there you are talking about uh, the, the, The sea of sameness and the the employ employer blend uh, you, mm -hmm. you you call it. I and don't. That, I, I have to. I have to hold you there. 
I did not invent employer bland. I think no, someone, no, no. Pe- some people think I do. I'm like, no, no. Okay. I heard it from Shiru Mahatra. So I, I, I give full credit. I did not. I'm not that smart. But the subject, uh, uh, I think, is very interesting because when you uh, uh, dig into uh, an employer and uh, start, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, talking people, asking them the questions like you just sketched, uh, you get answers. And the best thing to do is uh, authenticity. That's the most used word in our uh, yeah. live oh, yeah. business. Overused. But uh, I'm not always a fan of authentic stories because they all they all tend to tell the same. Yes. So in your uh, uh, podcast episode, you are, well, the, the the authenticness, but also the to be original and authentic. Can you, can you uh, tell something about that? I think if you told a story about how someone got hired and they were entry level, And they got a good mentor internally and they developed some skills and the company supported them and they were promoted twice and now they are running a department. That is an authentic story. But it's also a story like every company in the world can tell. So why bother? If you're in the pharmaceutical company, and I I, I do it a pharma because I know them pretty well. I I deal with them a little bit. Um, You look at the top websites and their career sites and they all talk about innovation and Passion, or not passion, but purpose, right? The reason they do that. It's like, yeah, but you're pharmaceutical. No one starts a pharmaceutical company to say, I'm going to keep things exactly the way they are, and I'm not going to save any lives. Like, no, (laughs) you can't. How do you get past that? How do you get beyond the stuff that's table stakes? It's, it's, you know, it's like saying my employer brand is that I pay you on time and the check will clear. Well, uh, yeah, but everybody, that's that should be true for everybody. You know, your employer brand can't be I don't kick puppies. I really hope that's true for everybody. Please don't. Don't no puppies are fine. Let them go. Um, but what is beyond that? And I think when we talk about authentic, what we think we're talking about is is true. Let me tell you, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of my day, your day, everybody's day, is boring as all get out. You go to the bathroom. You make a cup of coffee. You go just check the weather. You go check your email. Okay. Oh, there's a crisis. Something's interesting, and then it stops. And then you go check your email and you go surf the web and then you do a thing. It's all boring. Is it all authentic? Yeah. But is it useful? No. So figuring out not just what's authentic, but what's useful and valuable and telling the right story that you want to tell that aligns to that core idea of what the EVP is or what the brand structure is or a million ways to kind of talk about that. But that means something different so that when I read it cold, I go, I understand something about this company that's different from every other choice I could make, right? Employer brand's a function of options. Um, and this is another thing where COVID really changes things because if you're in Rotterdam, you know, there's, let's say there's 100,000 companies you could work for in your geographical area. And now suddenly everybody knows you can work remotely. Suddenly it's not 100,000 companies you could work for. It's about a couple million companies. But at the same time, if, I can, if I'm in Rotterdam and I'm a business, I can only hire people in Rotterdam. Oh, well, now I can hire people anywhere. And suddenly my talent pool shifts. So all these opportunity shifts dictate how do I figure out what makes me different. So if I am a nurse at a hospital, and I, like to, and I prefer to work at hospitals, hospitals are always going to they always tend to say, say the same stories. They tell the same stuff. We're here to save lives. We work yep. really hard. We care about our patients. Yeah, 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 yeah. I should hope so. Telling a nurse story that is different, that shows me this hospital treats its nurses this way versus this hospital that treats its nurses this way, that may be a very, very fine line of difference. It may be the difference between five days of PTO and six days of PTO. It may be the difference between 10-hour shifts and 12-hour shifts. It may be the difference between four hours of dedicated training time versus five hours. But to a nurse, that's the whole story. Yep. So figuring out what they care about, figuring out what motivates them, understanding the options in which they live. If it's a world in which everybody offers these same perks and you offer them again, you have done nothing. If you say, we offer world-class benefits, we have great health care. Yeah, everybody says that. What next? What else? Tell me the way it's different. How do I make it special and unique? So it's not about authenticity. Authenticity is a baseline. Don't lie. Got it. Next. But how do you get to unique? How do you get to special? How do you get to different? That's where the real, that's, that's where the real hard work happens. Yeah. Yeah, and there's also more than communication because in Holland you have an insurance firm yeah. and they their employer brand is based around uh, preparing, be prepared for the future. We will be one step ahead of the future. And they do that in everything they, well, in their communication. Yeah. But they also were one of the first to introduce for all their personnel the 34-hour work week. And that was also under the umbrella of better preparation for your yep. future. So it was very strong. 
And that's where policies can dictate the employer brand, what you're allowed to say. And suddenly they have options of what they're allowed to say that other companies would only dream about. Yeah. And I think that's, and that's where, that's why I talk about employer brand isn't about stuffing the funnel. It's not a recruitment function. It's a company function because it, you know, it, you know, it should engage with leadership. It should engage with HR and policies. It should engage with sales. It should engage with product. It should help kind of tie all these things together that, because frankly, no one else is there for it. Everybody else is siloed up pretty well. Employer brands, one of those, it's, it's the connective tissue between all these different organs that are very good at doing that one thing they do, which is great because I want my spleen to do whatever the heck a spleen does. Yeah, yeah. But I want to know that the spleen and the heart and the liver and the lungs are all kind of connected in, in, in some way. And that's what employer branding ends up being about. Yep. But uh, also the positioning you're talking about and in the first part, um, that an employer brand also has to to well n- not engage as many people but the right people so also yeah. telling people you are not the ideal employer for them that those are scary things and also positioning yeah. and looking for the difference that's also uh, not going to attract the most people so that's that's the interesting part but also the hard part but yeah but it, it, it brings me to the third part i really want to talk uh, with, with you about and that's based on a few months ago, or almost a year ago, you have published the Employer Brand Manifesto. And that was a, a, a combined issue with the, I guess, 16 habits of employer brand people. The, the yep. was the counterpart. <laughs> uh, and that was very interesting because there you sketched the, the you know, it's not schizophrenia, but it's that to the it's max. Close. What, what, what you've got to have as an employer brander uh, compared to recruiters. And it's also, uh, they're, they're, uh, it, it's... Well, it looks like it's it's a battle always, and I, I never understand it. But can yeah. you uh, uh, tell the difference? Uh, uh, if, now, well, in 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 a few sentences, the yeah. differences between recruiters and employer branders. Or maybe if I put it in another question, I make it more easy for you. But but as an employer, do I need a recruiter and an employer brander? And well, to give you the answer, why do I need them both? Yeah. So that's like asking, why do I need marketing if I've got great salespeople? And why do I need salespeople if I've got great marketing? You need them to work hand in hand. What marketing does is generally see things from a 30,000 foot view. Here's what our competitive set is. Here's what our competitors say about their products. Here's how we're different. These are talking points that will be useful. And these are talking points that will not be useful, either because they don't help or because our competitors are saying the exact same thing. There's a perspective that has to happen in order to be able to tell those stories. And then you tr- that stuff trickles out, not just out to the can- not out, out to the, the world, but to internal salespeople. And the salespeople go, okay, got it. If I'm competing with that company, that company, that company, I know what their pitches are. I know where I need to live to be different and give myself the best possible chance to win. Simple. Take that into recruiting. Recruiters do not like to write job postings. They do not or should not be the ones writing the career site. They are badly suited to doing that stuff. You wouldn't let your, your salespeople write your marketing copy because the answer would be buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it, just buy it, just buy the thing. What do you want? Just buy it. It's all called action. It's no, it's no, no flavor, no passion, no understanding, no perspective. Recruiters are there to take candidates who come in who are attracted to an idea and say, let me help you go from interested to taking the job. Let me give you the details that are specific to you. Let me explain things in a way that only you will need to understand. Let me answer your specific questions, not everybody's questions, because that doesn't really work, and help you connect the dots. At the same time, recruiters also facilitate through that entire process. If a good recruiter is there, they're there to say, okay, look, this hiring manager cares about details and numbers. Make sure to talk in that space. This manager cares about big picture. Talk about that. They should be helping kind of project the company back to the candidate. And that's a very retail job. It's very much a one-to-one relationship. Player branders don't deal in in one-to-one relationships. They deal in big ideas. Now, when it comes to doing the work, relationships are where it's at. You have to have relationships with every part of the business, with every every HRBP, with every lawyer, with every leader. You have to have those relationships to do the job, but your position is to say, how do I aggregate that idea, shape it, frame it, position it, and push it out to the world? That's the difference. If you have great employer branding, and you get all these resumes or CVs, how do you pick? How do you have the, you're gonna ask, first off, you've asked your sales manager to spend 60 hours a day selling. Hey, would you mind taking three extra hours, tacking onto your day and looking at this thing with a skill set that you don't have that says pick a better salesperson? That's a horrible, that's a horrible idea. There are experts, just in the same way that there are experts who can say, um, that's a good stock to buy, that's a bad stock to buy, that's a good product to buy, that's a bad product to buy. 
Recruiters are talent experts. That is a good candidate to talk to. I got the heebie-jeebies when I talked to this one. Let's try Yes, they look great on paper. They're going to be a problem. Let's push them aside. That's their job. So yep. you have to have both pieces of it in order to make it work. It's sales yep. and marketing. And what I think uh, works best is uh, uh, an employer brander and a recruiter have a different well, background, different experience, different point of view. Yeah. Uh, you should let them both uh, 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 be busy with the same problems because when you put a problem on the table between them, they're both going to do uh, uh, something different and that yeah. adds up in something great because in my experience, I hear myself asking questions uh, that recruiters don't and no. th the other way around. I hear recruiters asking questions that I would never have guessed that, but it helps yeah. me. So, yeah. so I, I'm really... Uh, a fan of working together with recruits, but it it Absolutely. seems a, a battle, and and that's well, it it starts starts to annoy me. Yeah, so I want to be I, far from that. But in, enough no, but, about that. No, but we, that, we, no, hold we, on. But that's fair. That's fair. I think that's a good point to kind of to take an extra minute on. I, I I am also baffled as to why there's so much friction between those two teams. They should be working lockstep, um, and I think there is no better advocate for good strong recruiting than good employer brand. The trick is, is employer brands should have access to an entree into other teams and other spaces that the recruiter might not get access to. But for whatever reason, and maybe this is just in the States, maybe it's not other places, for whatever reason, recruiters have built a position for themselves. And unless you've been a recruiter, you can't tell a recruiter what to do. I don't know where that comes from, and I don't know how that works because it doesn't work anywhere else, right? If you've never been, I mean, I, I have people tell me how to do my job all the time. I, it doesn't matter. If you're a designer, you know everybody tells you how to design. If you're a salesperson, you know everybody tells you how to do your job. Recruiters don't take any of that. And so when you come in as an employer brander, it takes a lot of work to build those relationships with recruiters to help them understand how you can help them, how you can support them, how your work makes their lives infinitely easier. And that takes a lot of time and effort. I don't know yep. why, but it just always seems to. And it works the other way around. They oh, yeah. make my, my work as a as an employer brand a lot better because they Certainly. have the practical lines to to the people with the, with the vacancy. So yeah. it, it it should be a two way uh, street. Yeah. Okay. Um, if if you well, the difference between employer brand people and recruiters the the, the employer brand people are are very broad minded or generalists more because of all, of all the skill sets. The difficulty is that when I'm an employer brander at a company. Uh, I want to show that what I do every day makes sense and that yeah. I get results. That's the, 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 well, the big topic should be called, yeah. uh, uh, I, I tell the K word one time, the KPI of, of yeah. employer branding. That's a difficult part. Um, can, can you, uh, uh, not, I'm, I'm not asking you what are the best KPIs for employer branding because yeah. that's a, a, a whole different podcast yeah. uh, on itself. Yeah. But what can I uh, show or, or, or what can I uh, tell people to show the relevance of employer branding in my company? Yeah, I always think about <clears throat> if I go to a doctor and say, what's the one number I need to maximize to be healthy? The doctor's going to go, there's like 20. Uh -huh. You yeah, got yeah. resting blood or, you know, uh, fasting blood sugars. You've got heart rates. You've got uh, oxygen capacity. You've got this body fats. You've got so many different KPIs and trying to factor in on one and, and, and focus on a one force it allows you to game in that number and it, it's, you're still going to die. And that's, it doesn't actually make you healthy. You're just ma maxed out that one KPI. So it's a very dangerous for employer branders specifically to focus on KPIs. But if you're sick, if you're overweight, there are metrics to solve that problem. And that just so long as you appreciate that that's to solve the problem, not to make the person live forever or be healthy in any, every way, you know. Employer brand to say, okay, look, we have a problem attracting candidates to the top of the funnel. Great, there's plenty of metrics that will help you figure out how to do that right. We have problems getting people who are willing to go through the funnel, but don't take our offers. Great, that's a problem you can solve. Hey. We have a retention issue. Great. There's metrics and, and ways you can solve that problem. You can't solve all the problems with the same numbers, so don't try. So your job is, when you're applying metrics, is to what's the problem we're trying to solve first. Now, for employer branders, if you think about it, we go back to those definitions of what is it like to work there? Why do people love to work there? What gets them out of bed? What gets them going in the morning? It is, a, it is an emotional quality metric, right? I love to work here. What every company wants is everybody who is there to love working there, not just to like working there. 
It's easy to make people like something. It's hard to make people love something. So if you can get everybody to love you, that's great. You have lower retention issues, longevity, you've got great uh, alumni support, you've got great advocacy, all the things you would ever want in your employer brand start to happen and start to happen very quickly when everybody loves what you're all about and you're all centered on an idea. Does that mean that my job is to make everybody love this company? I hope not because that's impossible. How do you make someone love something that's impossible? What you can do is simply make it clear why people enjoy working here. Remind them, why did you make this choice? Why did you choose this company? If you choose every morning to take this job and show up to the shop, why? What is the thing? And as you reinforce that message, we're all about this thing. Think of Facebook, and I, go, I know I go back to Facebook and Google all the time, but it's just that everybody knows it. Facebook's kind of mantra is move fast and break things. The more they hear that, the people who work there, whether they're new, whether they're old, the more they hear it, the more they're told that's okay. Do that. That's what we reward. That's what we care about. And if you're here, it's because you're the kind of person who likes to move fast and break things. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as you tell yourself, I'm the kind of person who loves to move fast and break things, where else would you work except Facebook, the place where all you do is move fast and break things? So there's kinds of a cyclical process where you tell people, this is why you're here. This is why you're here. There's um, <clears throat> John Gottman is a psychologist who talks about you know personal relationships, marriages mostly. And he talks about this idea that if you just assume having been married, you're done, it's a checkbox, I got them in the door, they're locked in, you don't feed that relationship and you don't reinforce why you like that person and why that person likes you, the marriage is doomed. It's the same thing for employees. If you don't reinforce why you love working here and why we love having you here, clock is ticking, they're out the door. Recruiters you know, are gonna smell that a mile away and start poaching them away. So your job is not about metrics, it's about finding ways to make people remind them why they're there. Now, to leadership, there are ways to kind of document and dashboard that up to say, look, from a sentiment analysis standpoint, our Glassdoor scores are up. P the way people comment on our social posts is this way. The way people, um, <clears throat> the number of people who share the content, the pe what people talk about in pulse surveys, what people talk about in town hall meetings, they're all going in the right direction. Therefore, you're making an impact. But you just have to be careful that that's to solve a specific problem and not to solve all problems. Yep, it's a big, it's a big dashboard with all the numbers of employer branding. Yeah, and I think we I keep throwing more on. I'm like, I think yep. your first step is to start throwing some out. It's like, okay, we solved that or we're good. Let's, you don't need to pay attention to that. And honestly, I would, I would. there's a good case to say employer branders should have like a quarterly focus. Look, there's a million things you can be doing in social and video and content and advocacy and da 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 But for this quarter, this is the bigger idea. This is the project where all these things, that all these little things you're working on should support this bigger idea. That's how you yep. make big yep. change happen. And that's where the metric should be. So the KPI, we're launching a website. We want this many, this much traffic and this traffic should lead to this part of the site and this many people should apply. Great. All the social media drives to the website. All the advocacy drives to the website. All the internal content drives to the website. It drives, 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 drives. You hit your KPI, project done, move that to the next, let it kind of roll. What's your next big focus? I think that's a completely valid approach to doing yep. great employer brand work. Yeah. In-house. Yeah, in-house. And uh, that's a lot of different ball games you have to play as, a, yes. as an employer brander. Uh, that's, that's, that's why uh, there's a lot of uh, competencies you, you got to have. Yeah. Uh, that's also the difference with recruiters. But there's all, in, in my opinion, there's always one thing in the middle, and that's the employer brand. Everything yeah. you do, you're, you're with the, you, you'd go the direction of the employer brand, and that, that yeah. keeps it all together. Yeah. That's almost as if we had a, a really structured conversation, because we started with the core about the employer brand and we ended with all the different uh, so that was very well prepared james that so is, thank that you is your for that. that is your skill as an interviewer more than anything <laughs> that you take all the and as a matter of fact I'm also, uh, uh, well, on time. That never happens in a podcast. podcast. <laughs> I didn't tell you that until right now. But uh, uh, but, but I think this is a, a natural point in the conversation where we, well, I, th I think we made a, a, a nice round of the, the, the area. Um, so, so, well, uh, uh, thanks uh, anyway, because uh, I, I thought it was very interesting. Well, it's, it's interesting just for me, and I hope <laughs> it's interesting for other people, but I, uh, I'm... Well, I'm confident about that. Um, as a final question, um, I would like to to well, I would like to give you the opportunity because uh, you 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 have been in Holland once, but long ago you told a me a million years ago. Yeah, okay, the well, Holland uh, I was uh, the Holland I was there was pre-internet, so that should help you. Pre-internet. Oh, okay. yes. Uh, maybe uh, maybe it has changed uh, since then. A but, I would uh, imagine. I would imagine. Anyway, the bridge you see uh, uh, behind me wasn't there uh, right then, but fair. Um, 
Well, I, I'll give you the opportunity because uh, now you're a, a sort of in Holland. You're, you're, you're talking to, to <laughs> Holland. Well, uh, a, a few people in Holland uh, working on the employer brand area. Is, is there any specific advice of uh, a shout from the heart you want to give them or something uh, funny, uh, anything? Yeah. Holland is, uh, is yours, James. Yeah. <laughs> well, hello, Holland. Good to meet you. Um, long Finally. time listener, first time caller. Um, yeah, the thing I go back to is that it's okay. This, this feels like a crazy job. I think your boss will never tell you it's okay that this feels like an impossible task. Your, your leadership will never tell you it's okay to fail. It, they will never tell you that what they've asked for is impossible, that you need to be absolutely just crazy to do this job. So that's my job. I'm going to tell you, you really have to be crazy. And honestly, if you feel crazy, you're doing it right. It's going to feel like you're, trot, you're driving in 17 different directions all at once. You're painting a picture, um, you know, you're painting a pointless picture one point at a time, but without a sense of where everything goes. And it's not until it's all done that you take four or five steps back that you realize, I did it right. There's so much doubt. There's so much fear. There's so much negative emotions in all this stuff. That is natural. Do the damn thing anyway. Do not let that slow you down. That is what it's all about because in the end, there's nobody else who knows this better than you do for your company. So push the boundaries, push the ideas, keep plugging away, just keep doing the darn thing. And it's amazing what can happen. Yeah. yeah. You, you once in, a, in one of your podcasts, you, you tell the analogy of you sit on your desk and be, uh, uh, all around you are for those big stones that, that right. from the, the, the many years, I, th I think I thought you call them. And every day you run around, you stand up from your desk and you give every stone a little push. A little push. And one day uh, the stone moves and that's the, well, that, uh, that was exactly how I was feeling uh, at that time. So that was yeah. a very good analogy. It, it's satisfying when it finally goes clunk clunk. You're like, oh, it did it. It finally yep, did the yep, thing I wanted yep, to do. Did. Guess what? It wasn't have pointless three... the, 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 the last few no. days. Yeah. Oh, now, of course, okay. the second that lands, you have three new projects to go add to that boulder list, but yep. whatever, that's life. Okay. But, but still it's a, uh, it's, it's uh, a fun job still every day. So, uh, Hopefully. um, James, thanks very much for this, uh, conversation. Oh, thrilled. Um, I'm so glad we, are, we could we put this together. Yeah, we're on time. You have a, a, a next guest in uh, five minutes, uh, I guess. So uh, <laughs> my time management uh, should, should stop right now. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Um, people can follow you uh, well uh, on, <laughs> on LinkedIn, uh, but the best way is uh, thetalentcast.com. That's where your podcast is at and where, where mm. you also announce your newsletter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yep. you have two book, books coming in in. Well, one have, is already on Amazon. Yeah, actually, I have, if, if you're watching on video, here's, this is a handbook. I'm doing okay. a series of handbooks that are, so like I talked about this idea that it's all these things. Let's do one at a time. Let's just talk about it. Here's how to work with recruiters. And it's 100 and, I don't know, 10 pages on just how to work with recruiters, projects, examples, emails to send, checklists, yep. everything you do. The next one will be about metrics. The one after that will probably be about content marketing. Um, there's another bigger strategy book coming out in three weeks called Talent Chooses You, but um, they're all available on Amazon. So if you want to take a look at them, please feel yep. free. If you've got, and if you've got Amazon Unlimited, just go read them for free. Enjoy. Yeah, and Amazon in Holland is uh, still a little uh, uh, more difficult, but uh, uh, our own Amazon has also uh, uh, will also have your books in a few weeks' time, I guess, because uh, then, yep. then we're, 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 well, we're going to read uh, all about it. So uh, thank you very they're much. There. They're there right uh, now. I've, I've, I've technically sold one in Amazon in, in, in uh, Netherlands, so it's there. Okay. Great. It's, uh, yeah, uh, that should be me then, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> See, you figured it out. Okay. Um, All right. Thanks for the conversation. Uh, I, uh, well, after this, uh, I still keep listening to your podcast, I guess, every Monday morning. Yeah, um, gotta keep making stuff uh, up then. Yeah, and I hope to see you maybe uh, this November when we have the, the Employer Brand Month here in Holland. I'm going to uh, try to, to, well, when they see this, maybe uh, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll be interested, but we hear it. Uh, um, see how it goes. Thanks very much. Good luck thanks. with uh, the good work. And, uh, we, well, well, we'll be in touch. Absolutely. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. It's been, this has been a blast. Yeah. All right. Bye, everybody. You have been listening to episode 30 of the podcast Here is AMC. Thanks for listening. You can find all details about the podcast on the website hereisamc.nl. Mind you, that's Dutch spelling. Hope you tune in next time.